On this episode of Stories Behind the Grind, you'll hear from Darcy Smart, co-director of Why Bravo and the Sales Game. Learn how the sales has changed over the last 30 years, how your buyers make decisions, and what role play has in business. My name is Aidan Vokolo, and here you will find business strategies, tips, and tactics that you can incorporate not only in your own venture, but your life, to help you simplify and strategically grow, scaling up the impact you're having in this world. Listen as I talk to creators, innovators, and game changers on what it takes to build an impactful business, uncovering their insights, strategies, and tips to help you increase profitability and develop a thriving team culture. Welcome to the Stories Behind the Grind podcast. Darcy, thanks so much for coming on the Stories Behind the Grind podcast. It's great to have you on. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Aidan. Darcy, you're the co-director of Y Bravo, which is the home of the sales game, which is sweeping the world. You made a mark in sales training with your eternal persuasion method and have a love of human behavior and bio psychology. Tell me what drew you to psychology and what caused you to combine it with sales? Uh, what drew me to a love of psychology? So I watched my first watched my first BBC documentary when I was 10 years old and I saw two neurons of the brain connect seemingly over a, a an invisible what I come to learn to know was called the synaptic cleft but it was like it was a, it was a little gap between the neurons that nothing happened between the neurons but somehow they knew how to communicate to each other and that was absolutely fascinating to me So from that point forward, I decided I wanted to know as much as I possibly could about this thing called the brain and ultimately why we do what we do. And that was it. I think my dad, you would have obviously heard of like neuro-linguistic programming and things like that, which is a bit of a, it's a shame what that field has become, but the essence of NLP and neuro-linguistic programming, largely how the brain uses language to interpret its reality. That fascinated me. I read my first book on that when I was like 11 or 12 years old. That was a fun time to be 11 and 12 years old reading about that sort of stuff. How it fell into sales was, I think, how most people get into sales, which was by accident. No one, you know, no kids sitting there right now going, I want to, I wish I could be in sales when I'm older. That's what I want to be. Everyone wants to be a fireman. And so they probably should, probably a whole lot safer. But basically, I just realized that through learning psychology and doing a psychology degree, going through all of that sort of university path to things. I simply realized there was very, very little commercial value in it. It was almost as commercially valuable as an arts degree, which is, you know, you know, everyone's got one. There's no barrier to entry there. You know, there's so many people running around with a psych degree and nothing to do with it. And sales just seemed to be such a practical and applicable way to apply what I had learned at university about the brain and how people make decisions. That's how it sort of came to be. So you've left university, you've got the psychology degree, you've been fascinated for the last, would have been about 10 years at that time. What was going through your mind at that point? Were you trying to look for applications for that psychology degree? How did that transition come about? How did I transition from just loving psychology to being in sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was fascinated by the use of selling as a healing modality, believe it or not. So I was interested by people making a decision that would solve a problem in their life or make their life better. And I loved selling things that were like educational programs, coaching programs. I love selling that sort of stuff because I figured either they spend $10,000 on a coaching program or they spend 10,000 bucks on something that probably takes them backwards, i.e. a new TV or something like that. I just figured there's probably better ways to spend your money than than, uh, on crap like that. So yeah, that's how it sort of became fascinating to me. I was, I was interested in sales as a service as opposed to sales for the idea of making the most commissions you could. What do you mean when you say sales as a service? What does that mean to you? I think you're ultimately helping someone make a decision that they don't know how to make themselves. That's what the service is. People say, oh, you know, I would, people don't like salespeople as a typical thing, particularly if you're talking in Australia here. I know your podcast is global, but to our Australian listeners, sales is a dirty word. But ultimately, if you don't have salespeople or the people doing selling either online or offline, you'd be stuck there making your own decisions, not necessarily knowing what is good, what is bad. But if you've got a good salesperson that knows how to educate you, entertain you, the sales process and the buying process can be just as valuable as the thing that you actually buy. It can be quite enjoyable. You know, We've all had those experiences where we've been sold to and absolutely hated it. And then we've all got those experiences where we absolutely loved it and want to go back to the person to buy from them again just because we enjoyed their presence so much. Is it the key differentiator between the two, having that presence and that the sales process? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, it's like who you're doing it for. Are you doing it for the commission? If you are good on you, best of luck with that. I don't think you'd be a, be a very happy person. Or are you doing it for to actually help people and to see sales as a service? I think you'll be highly rewarded by the field. And I'd probably imagine the latter would be the one that would actually be paid more as well. And so they yeah, should be, definitely. in my opinion. Yeah, you have that emotional connection to it as well. At the end of the day, it makes you feel better than that you've helped someone out as opposed to just taking money away from someone. Yep, totally. Yep, that's it. From your perspective, and you've been in the sales, I guess, arena for a long time. How has the world of sales developed over the last five years? Good question. Look, there are still a big cohort of salespeople that haven't caught up with the idea yet that so much of selling is done socially and so much of selling is done by people who just genuinely want to create great relationships with their buyers. I think that whole 1970s, 1980s America, what was that thing? They either buy or they die or some crap like that. So any sort of that sort of stuff is uh, pretty... Like that's still hanging around. Like that's still the clothes that people are trying to wash from 20 to 30 years of crap that was sold to people. Do you see that play out more in certain geographic areas? You know, I guess America would be more prone to that sort of old methodology. And why do you think it has stayed around for so long when there are better ways or or more updated ways of serving people? The main difference I've seen in sales in the last five years has been those that have adapted to the ability to sell socially and realizing that sales is so much more of a game of relationships and relationship building and problem solving for your buyers first and foremost, rather than features and benefits selling and people trying to take the 70s, 80s, 90s America approach of, I think it was like, I think it's the Jordan Belfort film where he's like, they either buy or they die. That crap has hung around for long enough that people have cottoned onto it and just gone like, man, we don't need to be treated like this anymore. There are so many products or services that we could choose from. We're going to go with the the guy or gal that treats us the best and so they should. Why do you think that that old methodology of state uh, like stuck around for so long instead of people people can't think? think, Yeah, people can't think for themselves typically. I mean, it takes innovation. Innovation is so hard. When I say people can't think for themselves, it's not a blight on people. That's just literally how nature works. That's just human nature. That's just normal. You know, I I can innovate in sales, but 99% of myself can't think for myself in all other areas. We tend to be able to innovate in areas that we know really well. But the thing with sales is we just became so comfortable with it. Like we just assumed that this is the way sales would always be. And then social media came along and changed the way that we market. When you change the way you market, you got to change the way people sell. And I think that's been a huge part of it. Yes, yeah, so there's a big paradigm shift to how people sort of yeah, interact with other people. Totally. I, that's exactly it. It was a paradigm shift in the way people interacted with each other. And also the fact that, that everything became visible. So mm. like reviews online, people could sort information online. So salespeople then lost the education piece they once had. So they had to adapt and be able to educate now in a different way and connect with their buyers in a different way. And it's probably a good thing that it happened. But the truth of the matter is it wouldn't have happened unless it had to. All innovation comes from a sense of almost pain to need to solve a problem. And that problem didn't exist for 30, 40, 50 years before you know this th- amazing thing called the internet came along and created something like social media, as an example. Yeah, and it seems like the, the rate of change you know, is continually accelerating. And so mm. I guess we're going to see more shifts in how sales is done you know, from now into the future. And you know, at the time of this podcast with all the uncertainty with, with COVID-19, it's interesting to, to see how, you know, it's almost like we're going through another another transition, another mm-hmm. shift of how business is done. And it's sort of, we're going that next level up now. And what once was done face-to-face or in person now has to be done in a, or businesses are now being forced to do it in a more virtual environment. And this has yeah. really played out for you with the sales game. It was mm. originally a in-person physical event we were traveling all around the US and mm. you had to massively pivot within a mm. quite a short period of time. How was that process? How did you find that? What challenges came up for you? What yeah, advice would you question. have for others that are maybe not stuck yeah. but are finding this process challenging? Yeah, that's a great question, man. My advice is get a business partner called Steve Clayton. Um, like that guy's a freak. Man, I have done a lot of work with Steve over the years and seeing how he operated when we needed to pivot the sales game was extraordinary. So for those that don't know Steve, you know, anyone who follows my content will start seeing a lot of Steve pop through. But um, 
basically, we had a discussion one day where we were sitting together in Austin, Texas in October last year. And we were sitting around, we were having a great time. We're in this place called the Sales Success Summit, um, run by a guy called Scott Ingram. And he had put together a community of salespeople that were just great people, really, really good people, really just nice, genuine, great people, but were top performers in their field. I think it was like the top 1% of salespeople from companies were, you know, the main presenters. We got chatting to these guys, having a heap of beer with them, love it, just having a blast. We had a great time. I said to Steve, I was like, mate, we need to find a way to take the sales game virtual because at this time it was starting to take off as an offline event, like a face-to-face event. I said, if we want to be connecting with these guys more and more often, we need to be able to run this online so that we can work with Americans from all the way back in Australia. Otherwise, if we sell to these guys and we're starting here creating great relationships with all of them, but we're not going to be able to capitalize on any of them. So basically had that conversation and decided there and then that the sales game couldn't be run virtually. It couldn't work. We wouldn't know how to do it. And we dropped it. We dropped the idea for until COVID happened. So then we had a Zoom call and it's amazing, Aiden, what happens when your back's up against the wall, what you can create. So we had the conversation I said, how do we actually do this? It needs to happen now. We actually don't have a choice. And we said, well, what would need to happen for us to be able to recreate the sales game entirely online and give the same experience? And we ran the first one on Saturday. Went for People stared at their screen for 10 hours straight. But imagine being on a 10-hour Zoom call. And we were able to recreate the entire event, which is an extremely empowering event, extremely extremely powerful in the learnings that people have. In my opinion, I know I'm tooting my own horn here, but it's, it is truly just a, one of the more powerful sales trainings that people experience. And so we wanted people to have that experience in the online world as well. And so we did it. And after 10 hours on a Zoom call, people finished with more energy than what they started. We we're all pretty like zoned out, pretty spaced out, but everyone was still feeling the rush of it all. And when that happened, we knew that we'd successfully pivoted it to online and could now start running it more in the US space, which is about to happen in the next couple of months as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so now you've got a platform now where you you don't have to don't have to physically be there. You can run multiple versions all sort of Mm. within the comfort of wherever your base, you know, wherever it it needs to be, which is um which is a great position to be in. Yeah, it's good, man. We're grateful and fortunate. Like we're over the moon. It's funny to get all philosophical about it and everything like that. We don't really claim to be the creators of the sales game. We feel it's something, an idea that was gifted to us from call it what you will. But we just feel like the sales game continues to roll on. We're just lucky enough to be the facilitators of it. So of course, in the offline world, it did really well. And you know, the powers that be suggest it needs to be on the online world as well. So we continue to support it there. The sales game, I guess, has a has a bit of a focus on on play as one of its sort of core tenants. And mm. what role do you think play has in business? Man, without play, there would be no business. Isn't that fascinating? I think it's the seat of creativity. So creativity can only come when you're uncomfortable. Um, and the more discomfort you feel, the more creative you'll be in finding out how to overcome that discomfort. So innovation and creativity come from a place of discomfort and play simply allows discomfort to happen in a safe space. When discomfort happens in a non-safe space, you are left with such crippling anxiety that you can't actually move forward. You can't actually take any action. It's almost like a paralysis. But when discomfort happens in a safe enough zone where you understand that it's a game, but although the game is representing how you play life, because how we play games is so often how we play life, When you understand that's the parameters of what you're experiencing, it makes the discomfort somewhat more comfortable, if that makes sense. So what we find a lot in the room when we play the sales game is people get to scrape their knees without having to deal with the scars in the real world afterwards. And I think that's super, super helpful to business. Imagine if business could create and innovate and find out whether an idea was going to work before they went and actually created it. That's where play comes in. Do you think it's a mental block of business owners of people? As kids, play comes quite naturally to us in okay. what we do. Do you yeah. think as we sort of age up in a sense or grow up, do you think we lose that understanding play as a core tenant of sort of who we are and how we interact with people and we, we try to make life maybe more serious than it should be? Yeah, we lose it, but I think the world that's been created has resulted in that. So what we're presupposing is that the whole capitalist nine to five workday, you know, have your half an hour for lunch, 
have a smoko, all of that. Like, and the whole idea that a business is more successful if it earns more money, all of that. Like, that's the world we live in, right? And that's normal to us. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to evolve a human being. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to dive so deep into yourself that you discover more things about yourself and grow that way. It's a good way to grow businesses. It's a good way to grow wealth. And that's great for that purpose. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for humans. It just happens to be the best thing that we've come up with so far. So maybe it's another sort of shift that either needs to happen or maybe slowly happening as, as we speak. Of Yes, you know, yeah, potentially. Wouldn't it be fascinating if it did? I don't know whether it will, Aiden, or not. Or maybe you're right. Maybe we do sense a bit of a shift. But I think the way things are will be the way they are for quite some time. But yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. To be seen. Watch the space. Yeah, that's it. There definitely seems to be a key advantage for businesses and people really that can in- integrate or include more play-based activity in what they do. Because like you said, it gives gives people a safe, when you can build that safe space. And I'd be interested to know what what do you think goes into building a safe space where people can or feel comfortable that they can actually play? Good question. Uh, I think the thing that actually seems to help people the most is because what you want to be really mindful of is not allaying the discomfort. Remember, the discomfort is healthy. The discomfort is needed. So you kind of want people to be in that. I think the thing that does tend to help people a lot when we play the sales game is that they're in there with, say, 25 other people, 30 other people. And what they experience is when they sort of put up their hand and go, man, this is, I'm just a bit nervous. I'm a bit excited. I'm a bit afraid. I don't know how this is going to go. And then they hear from like 24 or 25 other people like, yeah, I'm feeling the exact same. So I think discomfort, and this, we saw this happen with COVID as well, Aiden, was like, was people were going to lose money. There was going to be a lot of money lost. Businesses were going to go down, incomes were going to go down, all of this. And it's strange, the funny thing that helped us all sort of realize that was that everyone else was going to be experiencing the same thing. So it kind of made it just that little bit okay, not 100% okay and not 100% right or not 100% easy. But just that little bit of okayness where it was like, well, if we go down, so is the rest of everyone as well. So, yeah, it's funny when that, that happens in, a, in an uncomfortable play environment as well. So People like, seem to be a bit more comfortable with knowing so, others are. Yeah, so it's an understanding of you're not alone in going through the discomfort or you know the pain or the there frustration, the, the fact that other people are, whether it's perceived or whether it's actual, are actually you know, going through it as well seems to normalise the experience in a sense. That's it. That's it. You've got a history in understanding how buyers make their decisions. What are some key factors that influence how buyers make the decisions and how can people listening to this uh, this podcast start to maybe think a bit differently about what buyers um, or how buyers seem to think? Simply move uncertainty to certainty. That's the reason anybody buys anything. Find out where people are uncertain and where they're unstable and make them certain, make them stable. Uh, with your product or service. But the way that you do that isn't necessarily by finding out the features and benefits of your product or service. People don't care about that. Everyone's favorite topic on the planet is themselves. So you need to be able to, to adhere to that. And the way that you understand how to sell something to someone is to discover what their problems are. You know, if I were to ask you, Aiden, what are the main things on your mind at the moment? outside of this podcast, chances are, say, four out of the top five of them will be some sort of problem that you need to solve. Not necessarily a negative problem. Sometimes we have really positive problems, really positive challenges we're looking to close. That's a great thing. But if you understand the problem that someone's experiencing and see how your solution fits into that, fantastic. How we discover that problem is we just look for where people are uncertain or where people are unstable. And we help them be certain, help them be stable. It was back down to, I guess, point earlier on in the conversation where we're talking about, you know, how, I guess, people in, in sales positions, in a sense, trying to sort of facilitate conversations and sort of educate and help people out and serve people. And they, yeah, you, that's right. You do that by understanding what their problems are and, like I said before, giving, giving people certainty. Nice. Yeah, that's it. Well said. In a world that's continually moving to, towards more sort of a digital environment, how can businesses best position themselves to take advantage? Uh, get offline. So if your question is how do, you know, if everyone's moving digital, how do you catch up with them? The answer is sure, do your digital thing, all of that, but always look for where the pendulum hasn't swung to yet or where it's swung away from. So if everyone's online, I'm going to be the first guy picking up the phone and dialing, or I'm going to be the first guy knocking on doors because people haven't done that for years. So no one's going to be doing it. 
You always just want to look for where, where the attention's going. That's totally normal, but also understand that's going to create opportunities because the majority of marketers and salespeople will go to where that attention is. So when people, when people have been doing a lot of digital marketing, personally, I've built up my more of an audience by doing a lot of just massive value driven offline marketing and direct marketing strategies. I can't tell you how many books I've sent to people with handwritten notes in them um, that have been delivered to their mailbox and they didn't even expect them to arrive. And then they open it up and there's a book in there and a little handwritten note from someone that they've seen online. It just helps take that online relationship back to an offline world, which is where it's meant to be. I think too many people get stuck in the online world and then just stay there. I mean, like, both of us, Aiden, we're both probably guilty of this is, you know, we've got so many connections on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it is, but then chances are that's all they are to you. They're just a profile picture. And then you might meet them somewhere, you know, in the offline world. And you're like, Whoa, man, that guy was way different to what I thought he was. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had that experience probably two months ago where I was walking down the street and someone was coming, coming in the other direction. He recognized me. I, I had no idea who <laughs> I was. We were actually Facebook friends. Turns out, it was about, about 15 years ago. We actually we went to the same school together. But you know, it's funny how you can be um, you can be Facebook friends friends with somebody, and then sort of just see them out of the blue. And but it's often that offline connection that's that has a stronger bond. Or at least yes. that, that's how it appeared to me uh, yep. when we connected. Spot on. Yep, totally. Yep, I get that for sure. I would ask you a question. I'd like to ask all guests, and I'd like to get your perspective of it. Is what's your definition of the grind? My definition of the grind. That's a great question. I love that. Can I, ask, can I ask what's been your favorite response to that question? My favorite response is that there is so many different responses to that question. Mm. The mm. word itself has both a positive, or people have taken it to take a positive meaning, a negative meaning. Yeah. You know, not even considering the word itself and going, I don't, I don't associate myself with that word at all. So it's really interesting yeah. just to hear people's, and I guess it applies to language in general, how one word how one simple word can have a variety of meanings. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, I love That's well said, man. I love that. Okay, so uh, first up, I would say it's a negative connotation with the word grind, but it's a necessary one, as in it's, it's a necessary word to experience in the growth of anything new. I find I experience the most grind and it, and it gets tough and it gets hard and it gets it gets really like, difficult like you like you're trying to push through a cement wall with your hand and you're just just placing it there like it's just going nowhere when i'm trying to pivot away from an old way i was doing things into a new one because so much of you wants to hold on to the old world that you once knew that was safe and comfortable and could feed you and could do all of that and then you're moving into the new one which you know is going to be better which you know eventually will be easier but is very scary to move into because you've got less certainty there. There we are back to that. Again, you have less stability there. So yeah, that would be it for me. It's a great question. Yeah. I love uh, I love your perspective of it in terms mm. of that, that pivot and that change and knowing that things will be better in the future. Yeah. Deeply knowing it'll be better, but just having the, that conflict, that struggle to, yeah, yeah, to go struggle. through it. Mm. The struggle, man, that's spot on. It's just a, it's a struggle. But it, as I said, albeit a necessary one, it's just part of the journey and you know, probably go through grind moments over and over and over and over again in your career. So, Yeah, definitely for sure. Darcy, where can people find more about you about the sales game? They want to get yeah. involved if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, awesome. I suppose two things is go check out www.sales.game, best website to head to there for in, more information about that. And then other than that, come join us on the Game Plan Daily webinar, which we run from Monday to Friday, 9.30 a.m. Just, uh, yeah, you just connect with us on LinkedIn. I'm sure you'll put all the notes and stuff in there. But if you're looking for the link for that one, reach out. It's a daily webinar we run for 16 minutes plus Q&A. Um, gives people a psychology boost, a strategy boost, and then a challenge for the day. And that community is growing by the day, Aiden, um, which, of course, you're a part of yourself. It's a pleasure to have you there. So. Yeah, look, it's yeah, great to be sure. on, and um, you and you and Steve definitely drop uh, drop sort of wisdom bombs every day. So it's it's great to be part of the, part of that as well. Awesome, man, appreciate it. Dustin, look, thanks again. It's been a pleasure talking with you tonight. Too easy, mate. Thank you for having me on. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories Behind the Grind. Please share the podcast, and if you're not already subscribed, be sure to do that right now. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you could do me a quick favor and rate and review the podcast. This lets the platform know that I'm doing something right and people like the content. It'd be a huge help and I'd be really, really grateful if you could.
Until next time.